enough attendance now we can begin with yeah uh, i think uh, the others will be joining uh, but i think we can start now so already 10 minutes uh, ha uh, 510 510 you, you can start sir mm -hmm. yeah. okay so this uh, you know when from which point it goes uh, live on youtube uh, dr ajay yes sir yes sir doctor just yeah. start recording yeah recording has been started yes okay so good evening ladies and gentlemen uh today we have assembled to hear a distinguished speaker dr anirudh rajput uh who is a legal practitioner and a scholar of repute and a member of the a uh, international law commission as we know india is receiving lot of global attention on both political and economic front from stakeholders especially in the post covid emerging world being the world's largest democracy having the largest young population and the highest growth potential the pandemic has exposed uh weaknesses in global supply chains the interdependent world that that was supposed to be uh, reliable during crisis has shown its vulnerabilities and uh, that has given uh, reason already accentuated rather the tendencies of protectionism and the international public institutions uh, are in a way under stress so public policy in these uh, uh, moments of history both domestic as well as international uh, is of great importance to students of public policy as well as to the practitioners as part of the dspg webinar series we have been inviting experts to share their perspectives on the current issues faced by public policy practitioners and it is in this series that today we have amidst us an old head on young shoulders <laughs> dr anirudh rajput after his llb degree from pune's ils law college and llm from london school of economics and political science he has done his phd from national university of singapore and his areas of research writing and practice are general international law law of the sea boundary disputes international trade investment so this uh, specialization for international trade and investment uh, is very very relevant in contemporary world as it entails host of issues relating to taxation taxation across national borders intellectual property right protection dispute resolution mechanism public procurement etc he has been a practicing advocate in the supreme court and various high courts as, as well as abroad uh, for more than 15 years now uh, as a, appearing as a special counsel uh, for governments he was elected member of the united nations international law commission in 2016 for 5 years and perhaps if i am not mistaken the youngest me member so elected ever Uh, he served as the chairperson of the drafting committee of the international law commission in its uh, 2017 session he is a member of the study group constituted for the uh, uh, by the law commission for india to revise the model bilateral investment treaty and he was a member of the haryana state financial commission as well as a member of the governing council of indian council of world affairs visiting fellow at max planck institute luxembourg and a practitioner in resident at humboldt university berlin so today we expect to hear from you dr rajput your perspectives on the emerging world order uh, where uh, we find uh, what lessons we can learn and how we can move forward over to you dr thank you thank you very much uh, 
Dr. Pandey for a very generous introduction. Uh, I have to say, I feel very honored that uh, this event is being in a sense hosted by you and I had the privilege of being introduced by you since you yourself have an extensive experience of uh, how issues of international relations function at the global level and you have seen it from close quarters. I must also express my immense gratitude and thankfulness towards the institution that is the School of Public Policy and in particular Professor Ahuja, whom I have come to know intellectually very intimately over the last uh, six months or a year. I've had the privilege of writing a chapter for his book, which I'm sure would be out soon. And I've had a chance of being on some of other interesting events which he had organized as a panelist. So I'm equally honored and immensely indebted to him that uh, he taught me to be an appropriate person to be here at this forum and express some views. I must begin by some caveats. And I begin with some caveats because uh, nowadays we are in an age of specialization. And age of specialization normally implies people ask you, do you have a degree in that field, preferably a PhD? Now, while that's one situation, so I do have a PhD in international law, but I don't have a PhD in public policy. But the beauty of public policy is that public policy is pretty much like the Indian culture. It can absorb anybody and everybody irrespective of their backgrounds. And I'm reminded of a conversation which I was having with a PhD student of public policy a few years back or rather many years back now. And during that conversation, I asked him, because being a lawyer, I always need to understand what are we talking about? Let's understand the meaning of the terms even before we have the conversation. You know, René Descartes, the, the very famous uh, French philosopher said, even before we decide to have conversation, we need to define the terms. Otherwise we are talking about different things. Mm -hmm. Often described as two players, tennis players, executing fantastic shots, but executing them on different courts. If they're playing on different courts, it's not a match. So it's important to get the fundamentals right. I asked him, what is the meaning of public policy? And he told me it basically means everything. Because you might be a lawyer and you might be involved in public policy. You might be an economist, you might be involved in public policy. You might be a sociologist, you might be involved in public policy. You might even be a historian and still might be involved in public policy. Public policy by its very nature is a broad phenomenon, is a broad concept, is a broad domain, which essentially need not be its drawback, but also be its strength. And in my view, it's really its strength. Secondly, the second caveat is that today we are in the age of specialization as well as interdisciplinary studies. And I have been skeptical about the way in which interdisciplinary studies are presented. There appears to be a perception that interdisciplinary studies allows somebody without experience or expertise to talk about anything and everything, especially about areas in which he or she does not have expertise. I don't think that's the right approach. The right approach therefore is to understand where you come from, use your domain expertise, and then try to address the problem and try to resolve that problem from different perspectives. So for today's lecture, based on my understanding and experience, I would like to look at public policy from that perspective. And I want to do it at two levels, that is global as well as domestic level. I say so because since I'm a member of the United Nations International Law Commission, I get to see a drastic transformation or the functioning of the global legal order. Although I deal principally with the legal order, international relations are underlaying these legal relationships. So I do have to study, absorb and understand these international relations. And there is also an element of institutions. So there might be an institution based public policy relationship, or there might be a simply bilateral or a general public policy relationship issue. So that's one perspective that I want to briefly talk about. And the second experience which I have had 
of having the opportunity or the privilege to work with some state governments or even work with the union government on some aspects of public policy. Since I was myself a member of, of, of a state finance commission of a state, I had a opportunity of watching these activities in close, quarter, close quarters. But now when to get to the subject, to the practice of public policy, I think again, we are still stuck with the fundamental notion of how to define public policy. We can't have it too broad, but we need to have some target, maybe a moving target, but not too moving target, but somewhere where we can focus our attention to. In my view, public policy is that aspect of human relations, which has an inherent connection with exercise of public power. When I say public power, I basically mean it is an institutionalized form of governance. Whenever there is a policy, a policy that relates to an institutional form of governance, that is a policy which would fall within the category of what we call today public policy. So we can distinguish a public policy from a corporate policy because a corporate policy is for a corporation. But it is not just for whom the policy is framed, but on what principles this policy is framed is really the decisive factor. When a policy is framed for a corporation, undoubtedly the objective is making profits. I'm not com commenting on appropriateness or inappropriateness of making profit. Everybody has a role and that for role and, and function has to be performed. But the underlying objective in a corporate policy or policy in a family run business, even family run business as a policy, but the objective of those policies is essentially financial making money. But the moment a public policy is involved, the moment a public institution involved, the very objective, the very goal itself undergoes a drastic transformation. And that transformation is trying to look at how to achieve the objective of betterment of people irrespective of where they are, who, who they are, and from which background they come. We come from great traditions of Mahatma Gandhi, the whole Antyoday concept, the one who's towards the end of the line, his development has to be thought of. The reason why I make this point is as we look at the modern democracy and some of these modern democracy, the way in functioning, they have become constituency-based democracies. In a constituency-based democracy, the electorate have to identify themselves in a group and then try to seek protection within that group. So if you fall into the group, then you push for a certain agenda. And if you have enough majority, then you achieve what you want to achieve. But that is a flawed perspective which has existed in the Western countries and also crept in in large parts of the world. I would rather like to take lessons from our own ancestors, somebody from Kautilya Arthashastra, where the objective was not to push for certain objective, for certain agenda, but to prove, to, but to push for ideas of global goods and global good, which is often defined as dharma. Dharma doesn't mean religion in that sense, but it's in the form of a global good from that perspective, not from, from a purely economic perspective, from that global good perspective, if we frame policies, public policies, then does that does serve a great amount of purpose in achieving the goal of, the, of a public policy. So now therefore in a public policy, I think we need to get out some, some theoretical concepts clear even before we get to how public policy functions or interacts at the global level, national level and how it is going to interact in the coming times. The first point I think we need to keep in mind while we are speaking of these public policies is we need to have a clear goal. A public policy is formulated to achieve a certain purpose. Whichever sector you are in, if you are say, say a governor of the RBI, your objective is to make sure that the inflation comes down and then balance it with the interest rate. It all depends on whichever sector you are in. It might be a matter of, uh, of international relations. One of the major issue which is being now being discussed everywhere is of RCEP. India decided not to join RCEP. It's been a big controversy. 
and the controversy is fed by those who argue that india should have joined rcep because it is because international trade is good for everybody now the question is we enter into bilateral uh, contracts two two companies enter into a contract with each other when do they enter into a contract they enter into a contract with each other provided both of them are going to make profits provide that their interests are aligned but if an arrangement is going to be beneficial for one party and not the other party can anyone say that that those two party should enter into a contract definitely no so therefore by negotiating an inter international treaty during the process of negotiation it is very important for states to be in involved some people say india should have withdrawn in the beginning no that's not the way you have to participate try to protect your interest to the maximum extent but if you do end up with a product which does not suit your interests then the only path to take is to reject to enter into a contract you can't be entering into a contract for a global purpose for a theoretical purpose which is going to damage you your financial and economic position just like you won't enter into such a strange contract such a stupid contract so to say why should we expect a state which is a repository of public interest which has to take care of not just one individual but of a large number of people and its constituents there are smaller industries msme sectors several of these factors which have to be taken into account so while positively this this is basically a policy decision and this policy decision has to be or rather was goal driven policy decision so a public policy decision needs a very clear goal an academic might say well the goal is free trade why because free trade is going to result into good for everybody but what if the free trade is not going to result into good for myself should i still go by a theoretical argument or should i go for the practical consequences of that action in fact what i am re reminded of that during uh, 17 uh, around 1600s when britishers came to india when the britishers started trading with india india was the largest exporter of cloth to the world unless we were take till the time we were taken over by 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 the britishers by their fraud but till that time we were the largest exporters of cloth around the world we were almost producing one fourth of the world uh, industrial production and our exports were of a such an extent that the domestic manufacturers in mexico lost their businesses completely because there was a much better quality cloth at a much cheaper rate which was going from india and was destroying mexican domestic markets now in this scenario it was quite right from for the mexicos to impose certain restrictions on indian goods because they were destroying their domestic markets so by simply trying to say that there is more consumer choice because there are more products and we don't know what is the quality of those products and what is the ultimate consequence on the consumers of those products so without having taken that into account we simply can't go by some theoretical understandings while framing a public policy the second care one needs to take is you can't use a lens people often tend to use a lens lens is nothing but a theoretical argument a theoretical argument does not help much on the practical side of public policy on the practical side of public policy one has to have his or her goals clearly set out and then have steps whereby one could reach those goals now mind you world is full of unexpected accidents so even while we do have a set goal there are bound to have several accidents some accidents that can be thought of taken care of some accidents can't be taken care of one very interesting example is in china beef eating is a is a big thing and which is one of the causes for uh, for huge uh, environmental damage because that beef is coming from latin america so there's a lot of cutting of trees which is resulting into environmental imbalance and it's one of the reasons which is also a consequence of for global warming but that apart during the during the lunar year during the celebrations everyone wants to eat beef 
And because in China, their economy has improved, people's purchasing power has improved because of that increased purchasing power, they all want to eat beef, which they otherwise could not afford in the past. To control the prices, the government maintains reserves of the, reserve, reserve of beef. Like uh, at times the, the government of India has taken measures of stockpiling grains. You need to stockpile them in order to control the markets. So saying that the markets be left free all the time doesn't work. Of course, markets need to function freely. But there are certain occasions when states need to interfere, the state power needs to interfere. This does not mean that the state ought to take over uh, the markets entirely. This also does not mean that the state needs to be an active or a dominant player in the whole market system. Although there might be occasions where state needs to be an important player in the market. It may be either as a competitor or as an exclusive provider. One example that comes to my mind is lotteries in many countries are state monopolies. The reason why they're state monopolies are because if it is a left free to the market, people will go buy as many lotteries as they want and move towards poverty. If for several states say you only buy governmental lotteries, government ensures there's not too much of a competition and ensures that public morals and public principles are also protected. What I'm giving is a set of different examples and different perspectives which are used across the world. But these examples are used in their specific context. And that is very important when one is framing or implementing a public policy, especially at the national or a subnational or a further regional level. I was involved with, the, with a few state governments in India. And I used to always say, every state has a different character. The perspective of every state is different. Your public policy has to align with the preferences and choices and the character of that state. Because public policy is essentially about incentives. Incentive is the way in which you are going to persuade others, that is your addressees of the policy, to behave in a certain manner. For example, uh, if you want to, you often see corporate taxes are reduced once in a while. The reason for reducing is with the hope that they are going to have more corporate activity in your country. The, it may may not have that effect. On some occasions, it may be effective. Some occasions, it may not be. Unfortunately, in America, it's become more of a political choice to reduce the taxes rather than a clear public policy objective. But there could be a public policy objective which needs to be thought of based on several factors. Provided one has a specific goal, clear goal, and one has a clear path as to where to reach to and how to reach to that goal. One example of national or domestic public policy, which I have often found very interesting and often give is trying to frame policies with the participation of the people. So policies based on public participation. And I often give the example of the way in which the LPG gas subsidy was removed from India. Now, as I said, when you are dealing with public policy, you always have a governmental aspect of it. And because there is governmental aspect of it, there is always an element of politics involved. You cannot give a public policy which is going to destroy the government entirely because the government is not going to implement it. That is also one of the reasons why often academics are not entertained by government officials because the government officials feel that academics don't tend to fully absorb the practical realities of implementation of a certain policy. But on occasions, and I'm aware of some fantastic public policy experts who are academics, but who understand the practical functioning of those policies. And if you do have a good understanding of that practical functioning, then that certainly helps. To give an example, during the financial crisis of 2008, there were a lot of discussions about amongst economics as to how to get out of this. The traditional Keynesian model said, you know, do more activity, government should spend more infrastructure and kick up the economy. Some people said, no, there should be more benefits, spend more on the infrastructure. So the then Prime Minister of Luxembourg finally said that we have all these interesting ideas, but if we implement them, there is no way we are going to get reelected. 
So in a democratic structure, there is also a constraint that the government wants to get re-elected and also wants policies which are good for the people, but also in a manner which are going to ultimately get it re-elected. And for that reason, this LPG subsidy is a very good example of a public policy through public participation. What the prime minister did one day, he came on television and in an advertisement started a slogan saying, give it up. He said, all those people who are from middle class, higher middle class, or any above, who don't need an LPG subsidy, should give up their subsidy for those who need it better. And there was this very interesting advertisement which was shown where there was a husband and a wife, a young couple watching television, and the young man sees the prime minister making this request. And then the young man turns to his wife and says, well, my mother had to blow in a small fire which destroyed her eyes to cook food for us. If I'm going to give up my LPG subsidy, another lady who is in a position like my mother would not have to blow in a fire and have to damage her eyes. So I'm going to give up my subsidy. The consequence was a large number of people gave up their own subsidies. And after they gave up their own subsidies, one day the prime minister declared there is no more LPG subsidy. Now, if, and you know, LPG crisis has been discussed in the parliament, governments have had terrible time dealing with this issue. If any government would have tried to touch the subsidy issue, it would have had troubles. But the government, through public participation, by making people feel and understand the importance of these issues and getting them to participate, tried to replace a policy which was one of the most controversial and a problematic policy. Now, when you are involved in advising the government, you have to take care of several aspects. And now I'm talking specifically on the national aspects. I'll later come to, to the international aspects of that as well. Since politics is one of the important factors, you need to be able to give what I often say quick results. If you come up with a public policy plan, which is going to make massive fundamental changes, of course, that is also to be done. But while you're giving a long-term plan, you should also have a short-term plan of public policy. A short-term plan which tries to fix some of the important issues so that people see that some functioning, some work is happening. A very good example is I have heard that some railway stations have been transformed like airport lounges in some parts of India. Now, of course, railway needs to be transformed. Railway reforms need to be done. Well, it's a long 20-year process, but this government won't be there by the, by the end of it. But one quick thing to do, which will also show the, to the people that we are doing something, and then also we are doing the long-term work, is you just transform the stations. And when people come into that station and say, wow, this is fantastic, it just changes the whole perspective. So a public policy expert has to make himself relevant to all these issues. Now, I want to step back and take you back to, to issues of, of global public policy or, or, or international relations where now I often interact. I don't interact so much at the national level anymore. Uh, I, it's just the nature of the work that I do, which involves mostly states. I often end up advising states on international disputes with each other. And Again, while you're advising states in relation to their disputes with each other, you need to be sensitive about the political undercurrents of those disputes. These political undercurrents may be domestic. These political undercurrents may be international. These undercurrents may even be fundamentally disruptive to the institution which is going to adjudicate. I won't give any specific example because there are some disputes which are being considered by the International Court of Justice. But there are occasions where some cases were brought to the court which did fit within the legal framework. But if the court would have adjudicated upon them, it would have resulted into greater antagonism between states and a greater number of states willing to withdraw from the international adjudication process. A theoretical academic may say, no, 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 you have entered into, how can you withdraw? Well, please realize that's how the world is. That's how treaties are. Treaties exist as long as states want them to exist. The day states don't want a treaty to exist, a treaty is going to lose its relevance. What is happening with the WTO is a classical example of the same situation. 
although the dispute resolution procedure of the WTO, in my view, was far more efficient and far more well functioning. India do, did lose some cases, which I think were a consequence of India's own doings. They could have been presented better. There were other ways of, of, of trying to address those issues. But despite that, the WTO's dispute resolution procedure was functioning quite well. And so was it functioning quite well for several states. But the moment America, which was the creator of the WTO, which created the Washington consensus of which WTO was a part of, the moment it realized it doesn't function, it started destroying the system. Likewise, in the area of investment treaty arbitration, investment tribunals went on their own journey of trying to interpret the provisions of the law liberally the way they wanted. The consequence was expansive interpretations. The interpretations became excessively burdensome on states. And now states are trying to slowly, slowly get out of the system or remove the impact of the system. So while you're dealing at the international public policy scenario, you need to, if you're on the legal side of it, you need to be aware what you're going to suggest, how will it be received by states? Because that's where states are your ultimate customers. If you do not have a full detailed and proper understanding and absorption of issues of international relations, then there might be problems. Then it's also important as to what is the legal argument you want to raise. I have often said that you don't, in, in an international proceeding and even in international negotiations, you should not be raising the best legal argument. You should be raising the most winnable argument because the most legal argument may not be a winnable argument. Whenever you are in the domain of negotiations or whenever you are in the domain of international litigation before an international court or tribunal, your objective is to win over something, either a judge or the other side. Of course, law forms the basis of your reasoning, but the argument has to be a winnable argument. And a winnable argument is always a reasonable argument. The more reasonable the argument is, the more balanced the argument is, the better are the chances of winning the case, winning a negotiation, or even winning a government to convincing it to undertake a certain public policy measure. As we look at the world today, and I want to speak briefly about our current situation and where we stand and where we might go in the future, and that's where I will end my talk with and take some question and answers if there are any. The current situation is, is truly a cataclysmic event. It's, it's a transformatory event. I have, of, I have said this before as well. I think it's, it's a once in a century and not just one century, once in two centuries event. Because we are seeing tectonic shifts in the power structure of the global legal order. Now, I think since we come from the Indian culture, we need to understand or know this quite well that anything that is created is going to end. So anything that goes up is going to come down. So in the global legal order, in the global relations order, international order, a state becomes powerful, goes up. But if it is going up, it is definitely going to come down. But for a certain amount of time, some Western scholars, thinkers thought that no, now it's going to be just us. It's going to be Western hegemony perpetuated forever. To, to borrow the phrase by, used by Alan Greenspan, who brought in the zero interest rate in America and then brought the 2008 financial crisis, he said we have hit a development plateau. According to him, we have reached optimum level of development and now there'll be just be development and growth will never go down. And within his lifetime in 2008, we saw how the world collapsed. At the end of the, second, uh, at the, end of the Cold War, when the Berlin Wall fell, there was this view being spread in America is that since America is the only superpower in the world, now it's just going to be American domination all over the world forever. That's not how the world, world functions. There are cycles of power. A power rises, a power collapses. Prior to the Americans, it was the British power. And the British, through their colonies for around 100 years, tried to keep their control, tried to keep, keep, keep their control as a superpower, which vanished 
which was replaced by America for another say 60, 70 years. Prior to that, we can go in the history. We have the Ottomans, we have the Indian culture. Even within India, you have the uh, Mauryan empire. You, you, will, you can find several of those examples of empires coming uh, and, 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 and going down. In fact, uh, I have spent some time in Singapore. The early settlements in Singapore, which was initially known as the, as the Malacca, were which went from India during the Chola dynasty. So those who were in the Chola dynasty were trading in those areas and went and settled there. So we do see that even within India, these empires came up and fell down. So even in the world, this going up and coming down, down of empires is a normal phenomenon that always happens. We are standing at a situation at the cusp of time when those empires which are dominating the world are now collapsing. They're collapsing fast. They're still trying to keep the control, but their control is going, the, the grip is, is, is getting out of their hands quickly. The question is, who is going to replace it and how? One might say China has far more capabilities. China is far more organized. Chinese people are far more disciplined as opposed to us. So China is probably a favorite choice for doing that. Behind them, with a certain amount of distance, unfortunately, we are not close second, but with a lot of distance, we are second. We may be second on certain parameters, on economic parameters, on performance parameters, on, on development parameters, on, or on the way in which uh, Chinese people contribute to their country and the way in which Indians create so many headaches and disrupt the functioning of the country. Apart from these several structural problems, we may be at a distance and we may be a distant second, but despite that, we have certain inherent qualities which makes us a favorite, which a lot of parts of the world expect us to do and take. And there are several reasons for this. One is the Indian character. They know Indians are trustworthy people. Because Indians are trustworthy business people, they have a great amount of faith in us. Second, which is not our doing, it's our ancestors. Indian culture, is one of the most respected and revered culture around the world. I'm not sure whether we ourselves respect the culture as much as it deserves, but around the world, there is a much larger respect, there's a much larger demand, attraction of the Indian culture over anybody else. I often give this example, I was visiting Wittenberg. Wittenberg is a very small town in Germany, and that's the town where Martin Luther started the new religion of protest, Protestantism or Protestants. So he was the originator of the religion of Christian Protestants, which went up against the, the Christian church, the Roman Catholic church and started a new religion of himself. But that apart, the reason why I'm telling you I was walking in this town in Germany, which is probably distinct, has, has nothing to, uh, to do with, uh, with the regular understanding of the world. And in this small town where there are just a few hundred people, I suddenly heard this Hindi movie song, Mahi Ve, loudly. And I saw two German women dancing on the street with a lot of excitement, trying to imitate how Bollywood uh, or Hindi movie industry stars dance. So we might look at Hindi movies just as a mode of entertainment, but they have a huge impact around the world. I have traveled different parts of the world from Middle East to, to Europe, and they know our film stars much better than we do. What it shows is there is a great amount of receptivity towards the Indian culture. The third point which has functioned in our favor as a country is over the years, we have maintained very strong international relations with a lot of countries. And that's one of the reasons is the leadership that India provided to the third world, and it still continues to provide. In the G77, that is the group of 77 countries, which includes the Africans, Latin Americans, uh, and, uh, and other Asian countries, what we do see is because China is asserting itself as a global power, it wants to be a bit like America, a bit forceful, tries to throw its weight around. It is creating a friction and that not all and not every state wants to be associated with that, which means that they still look towards India to lead them. So there is a lot of space in terms of how or expectation from the international community, from a country like India, that India and Indians would lead the forthcoming global legal order. 
But when we say India, it just doesn't mean the government of India. Of course, the government of India has a central role because it represents the people of the country. But the people of the country also have a large space, a large gap to fill up. If we look at the number of individuals working in the Secretariat of International Organizations, maybe the WTO, maybe the UN or any other organization, we see a lot of Europeans, a lot of Westerners. As India grows, we also need to see a lot more Indians being part of the international bureaucratic architecture. We need to see a lot more Indians participating actively into different aspects of international relations and public policy. Also, the other aspect is what one may call it international public policy, but it's really a part of domestic public policy. Public policies in several African countries, several Asian countries, Latin American countries also needs expert inputs. And these inputs can be given by those who are trained in, in India, who understand these nuances, and then can also help those governments, maybe based in Africa, in forming their policies and implementing their policies. So as we see the world is shifting, the global power is shifting, there is a lot of space for a country like India and all Indians to fill in that space. And and I think what really distinguishes India from anybody else and what would make India a more consensuous player in the, in the global order is its culture, because its nationalism as a, is understood in Europe is very different from nationalism as we understand here in India. Nationalism as a concept is embedded in the concept of internationalism, because we always start with the prayer of Sarve Pisukhinasam to let everybody be happy. Sarve Santu Niramaya, let everybody be healthy. We don't believe in anybody being unhappy, anybody being healthy, irrespective of whichever culture, tradition, religious thought, wherever they come from. So that's the flow of thousands of years of century culture which we have had, which gives us a special position in the world. Several hundred years of, uh, of colonization, slavery sort of removed that identity, sense of respect, which we had for ourselves. I think it is just about time we understand the great contributions that our ancestors made, the great duty we have to understand how the global order is functioning, and our duty to contribute positively towards the development of the global order. And when I say contribute positively, I don't mean becoming another superpower, thumping its, putting its thumb, thumb on others, not another superpower which is cutting feet of other people from go, growth, but a responsible participant, a responsible player, a conscientious player, which contributes positively to these changes which are happening around the world. So I do think that there is a huge scope for Indians in terms of the practice of public policy. Firstly, at the global level, within the international institutions, global institutions, and for activities which will happen at different parts uh, in different countries around the world. I come from Pune and very close to that is, is the place of Santa Gyaneshwar. And I always quote this, after Santa Gyaneshwar wrote his commentary on Bhagavad Gita, he was still unhappy. And then he composed a poem. And the first line of the poem is Ata Vishwatma Ke Deve, means now I pray to the global Lord. So he's not speaking of X God, Y God, he's speaking of global God. He come from that concept of global supreme, the concept of Brahma in the, in the whole philosophy, uh, Indian philosophy is, about that global power. And with that vision, with that aspiration, I think we can contribute positively towards the practice of, of the global public policy. And while doing so, of course, indeed contributing towards Indian public policy to make it a better and a stronger country, which can contribute effectively for removing the evils of the, of, of, of the world, uh, help in implementing the, 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 the development goals and transform the world with its help and vision. Thank you. You are on, uh, Dr. Pandey, you are on mute. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. So, uh, uh, very, very, very Im impassioned uh, uh, speech, uh, a lot of learning points. 
bringing out the india's unique position in the global order and expectations of the global community uh, i want to touch upon this uh, uh, the eco international economic relations the shape that it is taking in the past it has been uh, dictated by wage arbitrage or shifting of polluting industries from developed world to the developing now as the technology is uh, advancing te manufacturing technology and we are going into industry 4.0 so there are concerns that at the at the time when the developing world populous developing world like india needs manufacturing the most the the wage arbitrage or the environmental arbitrage that initially caused these industries to shift may actually be clawed back to the developed world what what are your perspectives on that? yeah i'll i'll try to address it more in a theoretical way although i spoke about about the importance of practice side because i don't want to get into the although you have a specific question but the specific question has its own broader undertones of how how the global order is shifting yeah. and the global international economic relations are functioning mm. i think the first aspect and that is not just in industry it's also in international law mm. we have always been called as rule takers mm. you know uh, i remember i was attending a 20 years of wto conference and uh, the then legal advisor said that the first ambassador of india uh, stood before when at the wto negotiations and was saying declining and saying no to everything Mm. but we knew that behind him is a large country so we had to keep him happy mm. so what we do see is for example our participation at the wto why go far and I, i'll then use it to industry to explain that that point mm. is we have been saying no to things because we don't set the agenda the agenda is set by them we are basically responding responding to it and since i i sat on the drafting committee i tell you i can tell you with experience a little bit of experience that mm. if you're not drafting the text then you have no role in it mm. it's somebody else's text you may make changes you may put commas you may put paragraphs you may change the language but no the ethos of that is in somebody else's hand till you have the pen and paper nothing matters so we need to transform and i think there's the first transformation is a psychological transformation we need to change our view from being a third world suffering don't have competence we can't do things to a mindset where we can do things and we should start experimenting it so china is a, again is a very good example to learn from at the wto dispute resolution uh, mechanism china started participating as a third party because as a third party they had nothing to lose but it learned how the game runs and now it's giving the rules around applying the same logic in the economic field we have been rule takers there as well mm. we have been whatever technology is redundant from there we bring it here and then try to improvise and work it work it forward yes pharma sector is doing very well by doing something similar yeah but we need to ask ourselves a question is that sustainable and the answer is clearly no is it that we don't have the entrepreneurial spirit we do have the entrepreneurial spirit the issue is we still have huge structural obstructions for the growth of that entrepreneurial spirit once those obstructions are reduced i know it takes a long time because it's a it's a large country so many structures bureaucratic requirements it takes time to transform but it seems that we are moving towards that mm -hmm. and as we start moving towards that yes it's there there is a space for us to say well with with our uh, um with the plug and play systems with our new uh, innovators thinkers we can develop those things so it's not that we haven't done that or we can't do that because even if you look at technology 4.0 a lot of these people who are doing phd's all over the world are basically indians mm. so that's that's where we can develop mm. but the old model is not going to function anymore the old model that the west makes an industry sends it to us and we survive on it it's not going to work anymore because innovation is working fast industry is moving really fast technology is moving really fast so we need to catch up with that speed uh we do have the competence 
but we may may not have the infrastructure i think we are moving towards that once we have more education more availability of finance a slightly more co-op supportive environment then i think we will be in, in a position to to tackle these issues but i'm sure a economist would give you a much better answer than what i have given you thank you thank you professor aunya no Uh, do we have any questions from you have to unmute i think no sir we don't have any questions now so you can just give your concluding Okay. Mark and uh... okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Rajput. So uh, it, you nicely summed up the uh, emerging role of India in the global order, and uh, I think this is just a, a, a one of the beginning lecture where we have set the macro setting. uh in this series we we should be taking more thematic aspects of it or sectoral aspects of it industry specific uh, aspects of it uh to carry forward this dialogue as to how we can be a not merely a rule taker but rule maker rule contributor rule setter not uh, uh, setting the agenda not reacting to the agenda. Uh, that's a very 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 important point and i think the the time has come when we we will be uh, contributing this role more and thank you thank you very much dr rashitosh mishra osd uh, delhi school of public policy and governance to propose a vote of thanks yes sir uh, good evening sir it is my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of delhi school of public policy and governance institute of eminence university of delhi first of all i would like to convey immense and heartiest gratitude to dr anudh rajput sir for giving his valuable time and sharing his opinion how policy is based on public participation how the institutional based public policy is playing a instrumental role how india is playing a pivotal role in uh, all over the world with respect to change in the policy system how the practice of public policy is changing in day to day scenario and how uh, his uh, his definition is very impressive that uh, he defined the public policy as the aspects of human relation which have inherent connection with public at large for their bet uh, betterment and uh, he has discussed national sub national and uh, geopolitical and contemporary issues and he has discussed uh, the cultural and uh, other national perspective issues and uh, uh, i would like to say thanks again and uh, will invite him uh, again uh, uh, very soon and uh, i am highly obliged and thankful to our uh, member advisory council shri subhas pandey sir and our joint director professor vk ahuja for giving his valuable time and uh, encouraging us and thanks to dr sonu one and uh, thanks to all member of uh, student uh, working committee and to every students uh, professionals academician who have joined this uh, uh uh lecture like series thank you sir thank, thank you thank you very much bye bye uh, dr rajput uh, yeah will pop, you know sum up this program by saying uh, that uh, whenever this corona period is over you know whenever the situation gets normal and whenever you visit india so you have to come to to uh, public policy and uh, deliver a lecture in the classroom i would love to do that this is what we 
it's uh, great to hear you it's uh, always a pleasure meeting you and um, it's uh, really so nice to see you you are looking so handsome you know even <laughs> in the virtual uh, format also <laughs> as yeah, usual uh, th <laughs> thank you thank you very much uh, dr rajpur and thank you everybody for uh, joining us thanks a lot thank you thank you so much thank you thank you